Good morning. Good How are morning. you? <laughs> I've got Mr. David here, and we're going to get a range here in the, for the camera for you. Oh, Let's... that's so nice that you guys got a flag up. Yeah. Is it, Do you think the light will be okay? It's, it looks great. He's in okay. perfect view. Do you want to? Yep. She fussed a lot with that. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you for taking the time to do that because it looks really nice all right and then you can hear us okay yeah. david can you yeah. hear her okay just a tad more. okay can can you speak for us sure, i can talk here? do you want me to get up a little louder you can go down just a little closer. down okay let's see <laughs> okay how is that all right one more time for us nanny Test one, two, three. Good. <laughs> All right. Well, you got Mr. David here. Uh, if you need anything for me, I'm going to stay right behind the screen. If you need anything, I'm just right here. Okay. And then, well, just real quick. Um, Rosa, did we gift you all the forms that we need signed by David? Yep. Yep. We send them over to Dottie. Okay. He's got it all filled out and signed. Okay, good. Um, and then just let you know, I am already recording. Awesome. Awesome. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, at this point, when we're ready to go. Well, I'm excited because I've never done this before. <laughs> well, I will help you along the way. Um <clears throat> And it's so nice of you not to make me have to come down there because I'm just I'm just not doing well right now with my medical problems. And it, it sounds foolish, but just that trip down and back is very, very stressful for me. Oh, well, I am glad that we could do this. In fact, I've been wanting to do um, more of these because I needed to know how comfortable one you would be doing them. And also, um, this is a great way to get a recording and for you to be comfortable. Um, I'm hoping that when they the when it does record, it keeps me out of it as much as possible. <laughs> but, this is but not you'll about kind me. of scare me. You kind of steer me along, right? Yes, I will. I'm going Go to. I have questions that are just going to kind of help you go through everything, and then um, and then it'll bring the whole story to life. Now, one thing, I'm on a medication mm -hmm. where uh, it makes me go to the, the restroom a lot. Okay. So if we have to take a potty break, it won't we'll just, mess things up, will it? Nope. Good. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're going to be fine. I'm not going to, I'm just going to, I don't know, play some music while you're at the potty break. <laughs> what's your What's your name, miss? I'm, my name is Kanani. Um, my full name is Kanani. It sounds Hawaiian. It is. It is Hawaiian. I was born in Hawaii. Aha. Uh -huh. See, I I'm I can usually pick pretty much the Southeast Asians because I spent so many years there. Yeah. But uh, but just your appearance, because I lived in Hawaii for a year. So Oh, that was nice. Where in Oahu? I was I was in Signals Intelligence. Oh we weren't uh we weren't uh part of the army, we were separate. Oh, but it was it was beautiful there. Yeah. Well, I don't want to make this about me, but I was in signals intelligence when I was in the Air Force as well. <laughs> you were? Yes. Have you ever take courses at the Intel school? I've taken several courses at Intel schools. Um, I'm a linguist by trade, so I learned languages oh. at the Defense Language Institute. And then um, Air Force, we have good fellow Air Force base for our signals intelligence classes. But I've also been to NSA and a couple other um, training events for signals intelligence. Well, I, <clears throat> again, my, <clears throat> excuse me, my job was not in the hard side of the, of the business, but I had a lot of exposure to it. Mm -hmm. And I also, it took a couple courses at NSA, yeah. so I, I know, and again, we're going back a lot of years. Many things have changed, but well, my compliments because I know linguistical training is difficult. Yeah, and you know what they told me the hardest language is to learn English. No, they told me Czech. 
No, check's but not fun, like but it's not the hard. Um, actually, ling English is the hardest language to learn because we have yeah. so many nuances. Um, and then yeah. comes Japanese and Arabic and Chinese, those th and Korean. Those four are, are what they call category four languages. Um, Russian, Czech, they're all category like three, three to four languages where they're hard. You know, they've got multiple things, but they're not as easy as like Spanish, which is like a cat two language. That's one I wish here because of our largest fan. And I have some lovely Hispanic friends and, and a couple of them don't speak English too well. Mm -hmm. And I, I wish I had, I wish I had taken a language. Uh, now, did you go to any schools at Monterey? I did. Yes. Yeah. Because I thought that because I know the Army send send uh, linguisticals to Monterey. So, so well, golly, you must be super smart. <laughs> you look. Super I'm a little smart. smart. <laughs> you look smart, boy. I'll tell you. <laughs> well, let's start this, David, and um, we could talk about me later. <laughs> Let's start with, um, first, tell me your for, your whole name. <clears throat> Excuse me. I get a lot of phlegm and I'll try not to. No worries. To, to clear my throat too much. Uh, my, my full name is David L. Stump, like in tree stump. And where were you born? I was born in Grand Island, Nebraska. Oh, in Grand Island, Nebraska. Um, and your parents, what do they do in Grand Island? Well, of course, they're deceased, but my mother was a generation uh, that the, the, I don't want to say the majority of the women, but many of the women were just homemakers. So that was her occupation, which that's a big job. And uh, my dad was a salesman. Okay. So, so that was kind of my background. Um, now, do you have other siblings? No, I never married. You never so married, what, but did you have brothers and sisters? Uh, yes, I have a brother uh, younger than I am. He was in the uh, Navy. He did not go to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. But he served in and around the the uh, Far Eastern Theater. Okay. So he did have that. Because as you'll see, I'm wearing, we had a hero's flight that was sponsored here a couple of years ago. And he was still able to go on that hero flight. Oh, that's awesome. Because that was one of my, I guess you'd say, in the last 10 years, that was an experience I had that was not to be missed. Yeah, I'm glad wonderful. you got to do that. Well, we got to go for three days. Nice. So, well, you really need time if you're going to see those monuments. Right. There are a lot out there. Um, well, you, and, David, ahead, I'm sorry. No, 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 that's fine. I just, while well, I remembered it, um, the Veterans Reunion, the Vietnam Veterans Reunion, are you going to go to that? It's in Kearney this year. <clears throat> Excuse me, you you you're the first one I've heard it from. Oh, because I, I don't have locally here. I don't have contact uh, with any Vietnam veterans. Other than I go to the veterans club, and that I meet some some of them there, but uh, ostensibly I uh, I don't have a lot of interaction now that I'm out of the service. With, okay. with veterans. I will pass some information along to um, Rosa so she can tell you about it since um, while you're there. But I just wanted to let you know, because in Kearney, they are bringing um, the traveling wall to Kearney for the, the, the reunion. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because the wall was one thing I saw that was just tremendous. And I'll never forget that. I did a tracing on the wall. Oh, that's awesome. It is because you they have it very well organized by section. And you can, believe it or not, with all those names, 
you can you can find them uh, very readily. And yeah, I think there's I think there's something like I'm trying to think of the death figure. I think it was around fifty eight thousand was roughly the American deaths that are you know eligible for the wall. Okay. Um. Yeah. I so I'm gonna send this information to Rosa and then. Um, uh, just because it has information about this reunion that you might want to know about, just in case you're feeling up for it. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, well, let's see. You're you're born in Grand Island. Did you go to high school in Grand Island? I did. Mm -hmm. Now, um, can you tell me were you working before you joined? And let me know, did you draft, were you drafted or did you actually enlist on your own? Did you volunteer? Well, here was the deal. It was a, not a catch 22, but but in those years, in the, the we're talking 1961 is when I entered, uh, you had to register for the draft and then it depended on your local draft situation well. At that time that I enlisted, I was about ready to, to be called. So they had a policy that if you took if you took an extra year, I don't know how the Air Force worked it, but if you took an extra year, uh vis-a-vis -vis three years versus two years, then that that third year gave you a choice of your military occupations. Oh, yes. In, in the Army, you know, you put down, we call them our dream sheets, and it's like assignments. And then I think I think they have some people that love to harass you because you get 180 from what you broke down, put down. Yeah. So. That's a good idea. So did you sign up for three years then? Is that what happened? I did. Okay. And then in those years, we also had a three-year inactive obligation so right. you had a total of six right for your total um, commitment so what so i understand that you know you signed up so you could so what job did you sign up for or what, what job did you get well it was kind of interesting because i was in what they called the mechanized infantry okay and i was i had basic training at uh, colorado springs at fort carson but I had the rest of my United States assignment at Fort Hood, Texas, and I was there for 18 months. 18 months at Fort Hood. Correct. And then I got orders to Vietnam. Okay. What years was that again? Were you at Fort Hood? So from... Well, I, I, I enlisted. So counting out my basic from uh, January 62 until about May of 63, I was at Fort Hood. And then I had to go to a special warfare course for Vietnam training. And by the time I finished that and landed in country, it was October of 63. And there's a couple important things dovetail with this uh, I could tell you later or I can tell you now you can tell me now well the first very significant thing and the United States supported it because we were wholeheartedly supporting Vietnam in those years uh, but the week I landed in Vietnam they had what they call a coup d'etat and the generals overthrew the the, uh, they had a civilian, No Nook Mim, uh, he was the president, and then his brother, that family was kind of the ruling family there. And they were the only ones that were assassinated in the coup. And then they, they call that a bloodless coup. And then the, a, a group of generals took over the country. And then it just couldn't, it just couldn't get stable. They go from a civilian to military to civilian till finally probably in the 
I think in the mid sixties it settled down when they had Wen Kao Ki was the was the uh, the main person there, Vietnamese person. Wow. So that was that was uh, because we were locked down in hotels. We had no idea what was happening. You know, there wasn't smartphone. There was no communications, and uh, that was a tough week, not knowing. You know, hey, is the enemy going to drop in here? Well, the enemy wasn't even attacking. But we didn't know that, and it was, uh, it was, it was uh, like I said, a, a, a very, a very, and the other significant point is, remember I just said that they assassinated the president and his brother, the the no no uh, Den Dem and and no Den Nu, they assassinated them. Well, it was either a week or two two weeks later, Kennedy was assassinated. So it was right near this period. And the Vietnamese, I can remember, they loved President Kennedy, many of them. And uh, they had more mourning for President Kennedy than they did their own fallen leader. It was very, uh, it was very uh, uh, moving. And of course, when we got the news in Vietnam that he'd been assassinated, uh, it was quite a, quite a thing to digest. But anyway, those two things happened, and I just wanted to mention them. They're very important. Well, they were just kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, I guess they were just something that fell in line that because uh, they didn't have any more open coups where there was any big changes of government. Uh, so they never had another one. And uh, there weren't changes made till later on when we went over there as a force, when when the first big deployments came. So, but anyway, I just wanted to tell you that in passing. By the oh. way, I also like to say, and I, I don't get any money for these, but I finally wrote that memoir and uh, it's about my year's experience mm -hmm. in Vietnam. Yeah. Where finally I put to paper a, a lot of things in here and going back that I many you know that 60 years ago it was kind of tough by the way i hope i'm not talking too much but as you can tell i'm a talker and, and i I'm, enjoy it then i'll try not to burn your ear off no this is good um i am going to submit your memoirs with this um interview when i submit it to the library of congress Oh boy. <laughs> and um, but yes, that's good. So continuing on, let's let's start from after you landed in Vietnam and um the the, the coup d'etat happened and you were stuck in a hotel. Um what happened after that? Well, finally, about the fourth day in that hotel when we were all climbing walls wanting to get out of there. Uh, there was a Frenchman that spoke English and there was also a Vietnamese because there were no there were no Americans around. And there was another Vietnamese that spoke good English. And they mentioned that the 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 worst of the chaos was past. There was no fighting or anything and pretty soon we'd be released. Well I think it was the sixth day we were allowed to come and go. And of course I had to get to our headquarters. Now here's another difference. But of course in those years it was Saigon. Now, obviously it's Ho Chi Minh City today after the North, after their glorious leader. Uh, so it's called Ho Chi Minh City, but that was just a big, big name change. But at any rate, I had to get to the command in Saigon to report for duty. And I like to kind of mention, because this was, I don't like the word unique, but this was a, a particular important point. At the point I, at the time, point in time I went to Vietnam, we were advisors because President Kennedy sent the first advisors over. And essentially what that meant is 
let's say, for example, yourself, if you went over like at the battalion level as a commander, let's say a colonel of troops, mm -hmm. then when you got to Vietnam, your counterpart would be a colonel and he would have the troops under him because in those days, the Americans didn't fight alongside the Vietnamese. And all you could do was advise them on their training. But at any rate, in that, in that point, I, I look back on the figures and when I went over there in 63, I believe there were about 7,000 Americans in the country. And uh, that of course swelled after a number of big deployments when President Johnson declared war through Congress. And I think at one point we had a half a million over there. And uh, uh, I'm just gonna have to excuse myself real quickly. Okay. Is it okay? Yep. I, I, I'll be right back. Okay. I'm sorry, I gotta do this, but- No worries. If you ever hurt anybody on water pills, you'll understand. <laughs> I get it. Thank you. I, I won't be long. You want to go this way or this way? Like you are. Perfect. One, two, and three. Thank you. You're Do you have to do that? Yeah. Are you okay with your drink, or do you want some water? So it's been mostly in your throat. Uh, I, I, have you got iced tea? Uh, this this is uh yeah, it's green tea. I take some with ice. Okay, perfect. I'll do that. Careful. I'm going to put it on the back a little bit. You're okay. Perfect. <laughs> We're back at it. Here we go. My apologies. I, no I was worries. gonna delay I was gonna delay the medication, but I just couldn't. So no. anyway, I call I'll try to make that my only interruption. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> this is perfectly fine. <laughs> So let's see if we can get back to where we were. <laughs> right, I, I believe. Uh, we were uh, just discussing six days in um, and and then I think I think that's what we landed at. It was six days after you got there. Now, another important event is because I didn't want to be assigned in Saigon because I didn't want to be a paper pusher in the admin side of it, the administrative side. And I hate to say it, but usually when you go to a new assignment like that, and this was not just myself, it's kind of typical, you go over there gung-ho, and boy, what can I do for my country? And you know, that's the attitude you go in with. 
you go in with that. And uh, so when I got to the assignments branch, I requested that I go up country because I didn't want Saigon. And they were delighted because most guys wanted Saigon because of the nightlife and other things there. So they sent me to a, the, the city was called, they pronounce it Mito, it's M-Y-T-H-O. And it's a large, large city, about the size of Hue and a few of those other uh, Vietnam lo uh, locations. And at the, at Mito was the seventh military division of the Army of Vietnam, the ARVN, A-R-V-N, that was their home station. So our detachment, we were the counterparts and many of our, as I mentioned earlier, our officers, mostly officers, but several of the senior non-coms, that's where they'd find their counterparts. Uh, me being a lowly enlisted man, I was a jack of all trades, driver, uh, you name it, uh, wherever they needed me. And unfortunately, administrative, as uh, the administrative workloads were pretty heavy over there. Mm -hmm. So at any rate, I got to pick and choose where I wanted to go on that assignment. And I also want to mention that was the only authorized combat zone in Vietnam. And we actually in the army could draw combat pay for serving there. Okay. But it, but it was it was small. I would say our detachment was probably 50 Americans. And then of course their counterparts. But generally they went out in the field with their counterparts or they were off with them. The, the, the Vietnamese officers and such didn't spend time because we were in kind of a civilian location. It was uh, it was uh, like an old seminary with many buildings, and uh, we used that as as our headquarters for. It was called the the uh, see if I get it right the. Way you always remember it was MAG, M A A G is the acronym, Military Assistance Advisory Group, M A A G. Yep. Later, when they went to full combat forces, it was simply the MACB, it was Military Assistant Command Vietnam. And that's when West General Westmoreland, who was the senior military guy. That's when he was putting the combat troops in to fight combat now, which was not done when I was there, uh, to fight combat with with the South Vietnamese Army against the North. Because in essence, Vietnam was a civil war, the North against the South, mm -hmm. if you want to boil it real, real fine. Yes. So, yeah. So I, I think I want to, you spent some time there um, in Mito, Mito, Mito. That was just the town. That you were at. It was about five miles from the compound where we were at. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you were there from 1963 <clears throat> to the 15 months to 1965? Yeah. Yes. The but whole I time had, you stayed there? Well, <clears throat> in my memoir, I tell the story, but I was wounded. And in those years, because of the low military population, I think, uh, the low military population, uh, Saigon did not have the proper military hospital and other, which would come later, and other mm -hmm. facilities to treat you. So I was medevaced 
moved by tra uh, air transport to the Philippines. Okay. And, and I'm sure in your experience, you heard of Clark Field in the Philippines. Yes. It's gone now because they had a, I think a volcano or earthquake, something happened. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, that's where we went. And I was treated by Air Force doctors as part of my rehabilitation. And that's where I got some really neat friends in the Air Force. And uh, to me, I, I loved the Air Force. If, if I'd have had the abilities, I would have wanted to have been a pilot in a pair of seconds. But at any rate, that's so that was the time I was out of country. And that was probably six to eight weeks. And then I had to go back to Vietnam, make up that time that I was out of country and then serve the rest of my year. So that's why I come up on an odd count, 15, whereas I should just come up with 12. But the other was payback for my time in the Philippines. Right. <laughs> uh, I know there's a lot of deviations here in my, in my assignment, but. Oh, that's how all assignments are. And I want to emphasize, too, so people don't think I'm like John Wayne pulling the pin out of the grenade because I actually got hurt in a large restaurant in Saigon. And what happened is violated a very important principle. And the rule was, of course, I was like a hick from the sticks, you know, coming from Mito into Saigon. Because, wow. And. I love this one restaurant I went to. Well, a lot of Americans went there. <clears throat> and one night on, on I had a three-day leave. Uh, I went to the restaurant and a, I guess you said, perpetrator isn't right, but it was, it, it was one of the Viet Cong snuck a bicycle inside there. Well, over there with a million bicycles, you know, you look at it and whatever, but he had brought it inside the restaurant and it was loaded with C4 explosives in the frame and all perfectly concealed. Oh, and, wow. Oh, it was terrible. And that's where I got injured. <clears throat> and even though that was in a civilian setting, I received the purple heart for that because the rule on the Purple Heart is if you're injured in any way in a theater of war, you're, you're eligible. I never really felt right getting it that way, you know, not actually being in combat, but- But you but were, was, I mean, it, it was a, an act of, I mean, nowadays you'd say an act of terrorism. Right, because the atrocities, you know, at that point were kind of all hit and run. Right. The North Vietnamese didn't stand and fight like later they did, of course. Yeah. You know, um, I'd like to go back to um, your first helicopter ride. Well, of course, you. I have to kind of give you a little background. Yes. And in, in my time, we didn't, you know, the, the, the civilian world too, there wasn't that many people that flew back in the early 60s. I won't say flying was a novelty, but there weren't, wasn't the commercial side of it. In fact, you know, they still had trains that had first class passenger service. So basically, I, I was a new kid on the block to flying in anything. And back then, we we flew on a, it was a, what you call, I don't know the Air Force nomenclature, but it was one of the old, what they called turboprops. Oh. And that was propeller and still propeller driven, but it had some, like I said, it was called a turboprop. So it was above a, regular uh mechanical flight but it wasn't a full jet either right it, it fell in between so 
I went, uh, I was transported in that manner. And I was glad because some guys went over there on a ship, different ships that they would go. And that took about 30 days to get over there. And I feel grateful that I got to fly. <clears throat> yeah. And another thing, I, I don't like to digress too much here, but another thing that happened that was real cool, not for, it was sad, it was tragic, but I landed in Anchorage, Alaska, because that's the route they flew, Seattle, Anchorage. We didn't go the other route where you go through Guam and the Southeast Asian countries. So as a result, we had a delay in Alaska, but they wouldn't allow us to leave the airport. However, when I came back a year later, they had pictures of the earthquake, big pictures in the airport. So that happened in the year I was over in Vietnam. And that was significant. I think it was a 8.5 or so on the Richter scale. And oh, wow. It was, oh, oh, some of the pictures you wouldn't believe. So that was kind of a, I don't know, an interesting thing that happened to me also. And like I said, that happened in the year I was away because when I went through, of course, it preceded it. And then at the end, it succeeded it, obviously. Okay. Um, David, we talked about the, the what you call the, the trip on the prop. I don't know what it was, turbo prop plane. But I really like the little story about your ride on a helicopter. I'm sorry, I, I'm i talking a lot here and I'm excited and I jump back, I apologize. Uh, <clears throat> most people know now because of the, at least the older people that still remember Vietnam. Uh, it was really a, a an air war that was fought and the Vietnamese had no plane so we were dominant in the in the air control. And I'm sure your former background and experience, you understand this. So the HU-1B or the Huey was kind of brand new and it was brand new to fighting the war also. And I mentioned I was at Mito. Well, if you went to Mito by vehicle, because they didn't have very good roads and the roads they had snipers and there were there was things going on. Uh, and I just dreaded it because it was about a five hour trip. And fortunately, in those years, because we were so small, there was a commanding general who was in charge of the army. He was a four star. But the, the my assignment was the mag group and the mag group was headed by a general by the name of Timmies, T-I-M-M-E-S, just a down to earth, one of those type leaders that was really for the enlisted man for the Vietnam experience. And he personally met all planes at, at Tonsonut, which was Saigon's big airport. He would personally meet him and shake your hands, greet you, ask where you were from, get your home phone number, you might Back in those years, we didn't have way, uh, access to any kind of phones. And, he, you know, he promised to call your folk and he called my folk, which I was proud of. But at any rate, General Timmy's, when he flew in country, flew on an HU-1B. And it just so happened again, as my other experiences, it was just, I can't say it was luck. I don't really believe in luck, but it was just just uh, kind of very surprising how it worked out. But the transportation guy said, hey, would you like to ride on a helicopter and go to Mito? Because it was about a half hour flight versus like I said, five hours by tiring road travel. So I said, yeah, sure. So that's where I got to ride on my first HU-1B and uh, 
it was exciting. That was like any first, it always stays in your mind. Yeah. Um, that is awesome. And so you went up to Mitos and you worked for the mag right up there. Yes. Um, and, uh, could you, I don't know, share with us about, um, any close encounters while you were there? Yes, there were several. And, uh, I, I go and, uh, I don't want to keep going back to my memoir, but I outlined these in detail because in my memoir, uh, some of the other near death experiences I had, uh, they're very, for me, they're still very real. I suffer from PTSD. And, uh, they're still very real. And uh, a lot of them get into what I call a gloom and doom syndrome. And I didn't want that memoir to get too much in the negative side. So I told some anecdotal parts that had kind of a, a funny ring to them. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> one of the first ones I had and this was just, again, luck of the draw, I guess. But remember, I said that time we were advising the South Vietnamese. Well, there was a truck, a, a military truck. It, it holds about, it, it just has benches in the back, but it holds probably 25 people. Well, one of those trucks was going to go to the field. Now, here and again, the Vietnamese were all loaded. Uh, the shotgun wasn't the weapon. The the M2 carbine was a weapon of issue. But all these guys had shotguns, and they weren't trained. And uh, shotgun is very, very different. And you have to be very careful because you've got that round in the chamber. Or if you jack, when you're going to clear the weapon, you jack one in there. And you forget you got that in there. It's hot. It's ready to go. Well, anyway, it got fired. And of course, there was a whole bunch of us around that area. And we didn't know what happened. And I fell to the ground, which is the only thing you can do. And after every the dust all cleared and everything. Uh, and the reality set in. And hey, how did this happen? And it turned out, of course the Vietnamese young man was not trained and he made a, a mistake. If he'd have been pointing it more toward the truck, you know, it would have been a fatal mistake for a lot of people. And after that, the advisors always teased me. They said, I got one of the shortest, fastest haircuts that ever was given in Vietnam. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, was, I was very blessed there that, that I wasn't killed. So that was my first, what I call near death uh, experience, and I want to explain to you, and I don't want to, I don't want to taint this interview by getting into religion or politics, but I'm a believer in the Lord, and I believe His hand was in there, and that's the reason I was saved from death, because it was a near death situation. And I believe that you want to say at the hand of God intervened, but nonetheless, that was my that was my first big uh, episode where I could have easily been killed. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you survived. And me too. <laughs> um, you. I mean, in your memoirs, you go on to talk about some other events. Would you like to share any of those? Well, uh, this involves I I wore a number of hats because <clears throat> I didn't have at my pay grade. I was a 
SP5, which is a specialist fifth class. And at my pay grade, I didn't have a designated Vietnamese counterpart like the senior NCOs and the officers had. I didn't have that. So as a result, I got a lot of, you know, I'm trying to think of the word. It was a gopher. I had to be a gopher for a lot of things and go for this and go for that. And we had a rule that anybody that traveled on the roads, and this was just strictly Jeep travel. We had old World War II Jeeps and anybody in a travel had to travel in a con convoy. And the rule was you had two vehicles, you had your primary vehicle, which is the first one, and you had an armed driver, an American armed driver, Vietnamese driver, but I meant an American ar armed guard in the first one. And then the second one, whoever was traveling on a mission or whatever, rode in that Jeep. And our our one of our field units was about 10, they call it in kilometers, clicks, but it was 10 miles from Mito. And in traveling there, uh, and this again, this just happens in the blink of a second, I noticed that the lead Jeep, because I was in the second one, it was starting to go off the road. And uh, I didn't realize it because I didn't even hear the shot, but a sniper shot and killed the driver. Oh, wow. And, and the passenger, who was an American got a hold of the steering wheel and he got it guided off road. So naturally my vehicle pulled up because we were the protectorate, if you will. But the, but the thing was, we didn't know how many enemy might be there. We didn't know this was just a one event sniper, which is what it turned out to be. So we had a few tense moments where we waited for more to come down and it never did, thankfully. And then we got that back on the road. But this is a interesting part of the Vietnamese culture. They have a, a part of their culture. You don't, if, if a person is deceased, you don't touch them. And only the relatives get involved usually. So we had, a, in essence, a dead Vietnamese uh, enlisted man still behind the wheel of the Jeep slumped over. And I mean, I had to do something because we couldn't just sit there all day. So I went and I lifted him out of the driver's seat and I could tell that he was deceased. I mean, you just know with their eyes and, and I didn't even have to listen for a pulse. So I just gently set him in the back of the Jeep and we went on and finished the mission. But again, that was another, I call it a near death experience where the good Lord prevailed because I could have easily been the target. In fact, I'm surprised that I was not the target because in those days of Viet Cong, it was highly prized when they killed Americans. Because remember, I said we weren't into full combat, and a lot of Americans weren't being killed then. So uh, that that's kind of the part. But I could have easily been the target. And uh, now something just come up on the left of the screen. Rosa, excuse me, ma'am. I no worries. A block just came up on the screen. And I didn't want to touch the keyboard. Oh, no worries. <laughs> I will dismiss it. And here we go. Sorry about that. Jeez, no, <laughs> simple, but I, I don't know. I didn't mention it. I'm 82, and I didn't grow up with computers. <laughs> and I taught myself a lot on a smartphone. So, so anyway, thanks, Rosa, for fixing that. So back to you. Uh, I, I, I think we were on the, I was involved in the second near-death experience I had. Right. 
which but, again could have been much worse and could have been fatal for me, depending on if if they had picked me as the target, because right. there were no more shots fired. It was one sniper. Just the one. And, and exactly. And of course, we never did pursue him or, or anything, but but that uh, that was my, as I said, my second near near death. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to me that you spent 15 months there. Um, and this is all, I think, all happening in the first couple of months you were there. It did about about my half point. Uh, way through, I had the Vietnamese bomb experience in the restaurant. Right. Okay. That was my next near death. Uh, but again, that wasn't mission related. Right. That was that was time off, a time off atrocity. Right. So you went to the Philippines after that, but you, did you go back to Mito? I was, I was, uh, they, they flew, they medevac me and there was a, believe it or not, there was an air force sergeant that was stationed there. He was also hurt. So they met get backed us together and uh, they just took us as we were and, uh, flew us directly to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So there was no processing in Saigon. And like I said, Saigon would not have had the specialist doctors that the Air Force had to treat us. For example, I had a lot of damage to my ears and that's kind of a specialty treatment. And then I had a lot of shrapnel all over my body. Mm -hmm. And again, I had to have some surgeries to get rid of that. So that's basically why the next stop was the Philippines. And and I think I came close to maybe being sent back to the States, but they decided since I was only six months into my tour, the 12 month tour, that they were gonna utilize me because you know they had invested in training at all. And my prior training at, uh, at the uh, command center at, at North Bragg, the Special Warfare Center. That's where I had a, a, a like preparatory course for Vietnam. And that lasted about eight weeks. So, you know, the, the service has all this time invested. So if I'd have had just a couple months to go on my tour, I'm sure they would have just canceled it and be done with it. But I was only six months in. Mm -hmm. So I think like I told you before we started, the interview, they added the time I was in the Philippines back on my tour. So that's why I did 15 months versus 12 months. Interesting. Yeah. So um, <laughs> the, so you went to the Philippines and then you went back. Did you go back to Mito? That directly back, yes. Okay. And did another six more months, basically. I and I sir, I finished my tour there. Okay. Um anything uh, I don't know, anything to talk about in that last six months? I mean, we talked about, you know, um those during that part, but just yeah, just anything that you'd like to share with us about the last six months? Well, one of the Again, I hate to get into all the doom and gloom. So in the last six months, I want to, can I tell one story? Sure. Uh, this, this would never happen again. But in the politics of the thing, Johnson, when he replaced the two generals that I spoke of earlier in Vietnam, they were replaced by a senior general, four star, by the name of William C. Westmoreland. Mm -hmm. And I was getting near the end of my tour when General Westmoreland took over. 
Now, what's significant about him is normally in the chain of command, there's a lot of people in Washington that they go through and, and uh, like maybe the, the chief of staff and the joint chairman, they have to go through all that. Well, <clears throat> Johnson, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, Johnson didn't want it set up that way because he had direct control. He, he tried to control the war, which to me was one of his big mistakes. But be that as it may, when he appointed Westmoreland, Westmoreland reported directly. So you can imagine, here's a four-star commander, and it's like he's jumping over the Army Chief of Staff, which is a high, a very high level, or the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs rotates among the services. But if it happens to be the Army, then you've got a four-star chairman of the Joint Chiefs that's even above the chief of staff of the army. Well, again, Westmoreland, you know, he didn't have them as bosses or I'm sure they came over to inspect and stuff, but he reported directly to the president of the United States. And that's, to me, that's highly unique. And that's why I think he caught a lot of blame for the way the war started turning out badly for us, very badly. Right. But at any rate, getting back to General Westmoreland and my story, he'd been in country about maybe a month. So he was still going on tours just to familiarize himself with the different locations. We were split at that time into four core areas the first through fourth core and our core, which I think was the first or either the first or the fourth was the only combat one. So you can imagine they all wanted to come out and see it because they had a rule if they came out and if they stayed over 24 hours, they got combat pay. So I think, <laughs> I often say this, but I will. I think some of them came just to, to get their combat, but be that as it may, that that's uh, that's the way it was set up. So we were getting ready to have our first inspection by General Westmoreland, and of course, first of all, after a commander's been around for a while, you know his idiosyncrasies and his little pet quirks and all. Well, nobody knew about Westmoreland because he hadn't visited enough places. So we were on the schedule and oh boy, we were, as they say in the military, standing tall for inspection. And he was to arrive the next day. So we worked all night on that inspection. Well, as things happened in the military the next day, and we had a direct hotline to the general's headquarters so that the commander of our detachment, who was a full colonel, uh, he was, you know, notified directly if if Saigon was, was had an urgent message, and so the hotline and you could hear it all over the building went off, and the commander, our commander, took the call, and he told us this is about eight in the morning. He said, "Well, you could all stand down. The general just canceled the trip." So we were kind of relieved, you know. Uh, even though we'd done all of the work for not, at least it was all up to speed or up to par, so that next time we'd be close to being ready a lot more than we were. So our commander and the deputy commander and uh, the headquarters there where I was doing some admin work at this time, I was the admin officer because they didn't have an admin officer. So that was, again, I was enlisted, but I was tasked to fill that job. And so the hotline went off. It's about three in the afternoon. And I answered it. Nobody else was around. And the person at the other end said, well, are you about ready for the general? 
And I said, no, we are not. We can't let me cancel. How come you're asking me about his trip? They said, well, in about 10 minutes, he'll be landing at the Mito helipad. And we hope there's somebody going to go out there and greet him. Well, here was my dilemma. I was me, myself, and I sitting there, and I didn't have anybody to task to beat him. And normally, uh, an officer of his standing, you know, the commander personally goes out there and greets him. That's just a protocol thing. So I had to think fast. So I got on the radio, and the commander and the deputy commander, they were already in the field uh, doing a, a, an inspection. So I thought, well, I better go pick General Westmoreland up. Right. So they did have a sedan for VIPs. So I hopped in the old sedan and I went down to the helipad and the, the helicopter already landed. Because, you know, when they when a general officer travels in a, a we call them a bird, the Huey bird, they've got his standard, the number of stars on the side. So you know right away who it is. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, here we go. So I did the best thing. I got out of the sedan. I opened the back doors and I went over and I reported to him, which is the protocol. And I did, I shook like a leaf, but I reported to him. And he said, well, stand down, stand. And he was very polite. And I said, well, sir, the commander, the deputy commander, were anticipating this visit. And then it was canceled out. And he said, I'm aware of that. And I said, well, I was trying to give them a little alibi. And I said, well, that's why they're not here. So as a result, uh, it was, I think it was about four miles to the headquarters to the helipad. So as a result, I got to drive him and he was very talkative. And uh, we shared at that time, there was my last name is Stump, like Tree Stump. And there was an Admiral Stump in the Navy. And uh, I don't know if he was a commander or what, but Westmoreland knew him. And he said, are you any relation? And I said, no, sir, I'm not. So we got to the hell, we got to the headquarters and uh, it was still just him and I, and I got out of the vehicle, opened the door and I gave him the OI ball the salute. And uh, our commander was already there now on the scene. And man, oh man, I didn't know what was <laughs> what was going to happen. And the general told him, he said, you know, this young man has done an outstanding job. He met my my ship and my bird, and and uh, he's he's kind of given me a little thumbnail uh, organizational part of how how you were co-located and and some of the mission. He said he's already covered some of that, and I'm very appreciated and I commend him for his job because I thought oh boy the commander is going to say well I told him a lot of stuff and I shouldn't have and, but uh, the commander then after that also verbally commended me because of, of the quick action I took but like I said that's that's a it didn't, this time I wasn't on my first helicopter ride but I met my first helicopter and normally in a million years, an enlisted guy would never have had that opportunity. So that's kind of why I wanted to share that with you. No, that's an, an amazing story. Sorry, it's kind of verbose, but some of these things I have to get into the background a little or they're not going to mean anything. Yeah. Um. And I, I mean, I know you have a couple other uh, stories, um, but I wanted to, um, and they're in your memoir, so that's great. And we, we will share those. Um, but I, I guess- Thank you for, thank you for reading it. Oh, yes. I hope um, it didn't put you to sleep. It, no, like you said, you had a couple uh, anecdotes in there that were quite funny. And sometimes you you feel bad for laughing at times because they were rough times, but you, I think you nicely portrayed it with a little bit of humor. So that way 
I made it for interesting reading. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but you know, I guess there's a lot in your in your memoirs about um your PTSD and just the mental challenge of the entire war and um your time in the service. Um and um I guess I want to talk about because you you went to Vietnam, you, you did 15 months there. <clears throat> um, I would like to talk about when you left Vietnam. Yes, by all means. And um, just explain to me, maybe if you can remember that last day in Vietnam and then, you know, because um, I know you you still served a little bit longer. You didn't get out right after Vietnam. Yes, right. That's correct. But just can you tell me just right about about the time after you left Vietnam, or like that last day in Vietnam, and just those feelings you had, and then um, what happened when you got home or back to the states? Well, I can remember the last day, just like I remembered the first with the coup d'état although it was nothing like the coup d'etat. But I should explain to you, and I think based on your outstanding background and service, and thank you for your service, by the way. Uh, I, I think just having discussed that with you earlier, uh, I, I think you will understand that at least in the army, when guys are overseas, they make up a short timers calendar. And usually that's the 30 day calendar they put on the wall and they're counting right down to the minute and the hour and the second. And I don't really remember doing that. And I had some close Vietnamese friendship and I don't mean some of the bar ladies, but I mean with a couple of families and I was torn to have to leave because I was leaving them behind. And at that time, I still felt, because I changed my mind. I don't know if people want to hear this that are going to listen to the interview. But when I went over, I was gung-ho and I was 100% for President uh, uh, Johnson and, and uh, the whole nine yards. But over there, I got very disillusioned. And I saw that happen many, many times. Because you get to a point in time over there, you realize, and I didn't have the, what do they call it, the clairvoyance, the ability to look ahead. Obviously, I was like people in this country. So I had no idea what was going to happen in Vietnam. And at that point, the American people were being lied to. I, I can't put it in a nice perspective. They were down and out being lied to, being told we were winning. And many times we were told that because they didn't want to face the truth. We were losing. Because first of all, even in the early combat years over there, I hate to say it, but the North Vietnamese soldier could outfight the South Vietnamese soldier. And again, I'm sure it's because that country with, at the time was run by Ho Chi Minh. He, he was, but he had a principal army, army uh, one of the Vietnam service, I think army that really ran that war and his name was General Gap, D-A-P. And, and uh, he was, at, but again, it was all a, it was a communist liberation army, was, is what North Vietnam, Vietnam was called. So at any rate, to kind of, again, I'm sorry, I digress, but the, the last day feelings, it's like any time you leave a place and you, you're leaving some people behind and it's, it, you're kind of in a quandary because, well, you know, you're not going to see them again, probably. But the added thing here is 
you don't know if you'll see them alive again and, and how they're going to make out. And right away, you know, it didn't take Einstein to figure out that if there was any trouble and America decided to pull out of Vietnam, they weren't going to be, and they being the South, they were not going to be able to win that war. No matter what Washington said, either the civilian side of it, the ambassador channels, or the military general, Westmoreland. And there were, there were so many reasons for that. And I don't want to get into that. But that's some of the feelings I had at the last day because the poor South the Vietnamese, I just felt there'll come a time they're going to really pay a price. And of course, right after we left, Vietnam fell to the North within about, I think it was six months or less. And right away we knew, you know, it, 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 it's almost common sense that all the people working for our side, and we had a lot of Vietnamese good people, civilians working for, for the United States, those people were really, really going to get it tough because, you know, and, and it worked out that way. Once the, once the communists took over, then they went into retraining programs. They assassinated a whole bunch of people and there was a lot of turmoil, but you know, that, but he, that was kind of as a prelude that was in the back of my mind when I left and I hoped like we all hoped that we would win the war. And we were being told we were winning the war. And then I would say, this this was in 60, end of 64, I left. And of course, then when they had the Gulf of Tonkin uh, incident and then Johnson put the first 150,000 combat forces in there, that's when we, declared war via Congress for Vietnam. And we were fighting alongside the Vietnamese, whereas before we were advising them. So I could, you know, I kind of sensed that on the fringes. And then of course there's the old, and, and this was very real. Uh, and, and it's felt by many returning people uh, how do I explain it? Even if you were never in a situation like Vietnam, and I think you might yourself, based on your outstanding service, you, you might recognize this. You have a feeling that things are going to be the same with respect to your family and your loved ones. Well, that's not the case. And in any walk of life, even outside of the military, things don't stand still, they change. And for the most part, this is where, and especially the military that were married or the ones like me that live still with their folk, they're the ones that see that change. Even that, you know, I consider that 15 months of short change. But they said in my personality, for example, and later on, when the army finally recognized PTSD, it took them till 1985 to do that. So I had about roughly, oh, I had roughly about 10 years where there was no kind of program set up for the mental side of the damage that came to me. And that was kind of on my mind because I thought, well, I don't, I, 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 I didn't know what PTSD was. And I, I just kind of sensed something was wrong with me. And I even brought it up with the Air Force psychologists before I left the Philippines. But it never was addressed. And of course, coming back home, 
it wouldn't be addressed either. But the point was, I was not the same mentally, and I wasn't on the verge of a breakdown or nothing, but mentally I had changed. Physically, I changed a little bit, but not much. And spirit, spiritually, I tried to hold the belief in God all the way through. But there's just a lot of anxiety when you're, when you know it's going to be your last day. And then there's kind of a funny story because in those years, the, these commercial airlines chartered all the, the planes that flew back and forth. And we used to say those planes was dry as a bone. And me and an air ain't a drop of booze on the on the flight, if you like it. A little, how do we say, a little pick me up. But anyway, uh, so I always had, a, I always carried a flask. <laughs> and then I'd sit there and order about 20 iced teas. And uh, uh. <laughs> the steward said, boy, what are you drinking there? Oh, nothing. Uh, but at any rate, I had, uh, I had prepared for that because I, I had, and I, when I flew down there, I had a flask too, but the, 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 the other part of it, I don't know if you enjoy a social beer or not, but to me, there's nothing worse than a warm beer. And that's the way the Vietnam bees drink it. So you got one or two choices. You can gag on warm beer or put <laughs> ice in it. So I was at the Saigon, which is called Tonson at the airport. And I had about three hour wait. And one of their beers over there, they call it Bami Ba, which is, that's the Vietnamese way to say 33, because that's what the beer was called. Mm -hmm. And we always used to joke because it, it was so terrible. We used to say that was full of formaldehyde. So, you know, we already had half our embalming fluid before we drank it. But so anyway, I remember I ordered a couple of those and I said, oh boy, won't be having to drink any more ice in my beer. And then just, I don't know, just a lot of anxiety about getting back home. You've missed over a year there. Catch up, you know, with your friends and family. And, you know, that's exciting because that's going to be a big change. And unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, it's in many cases, it's a sad change the way the veteran has has gone through it and depending mentally how bad it's affected them and all. But but uh, that's that's kind of where I was at on my last day. It was exciting, chaotic, full of kind of fond memories of the Vietnamese people. So I had I had no bitterness, and I got back just before, if you will recall from the history of Vietnam, that we had the the terrible loss of support in this country, and the military guy took it on the chin. That's where they this never happened to me, thank the Lord, but where you know they they got in uh, the demonstrations the younger not just the younger people either, but they got into the dis demonstrations at all, and the flag burning, just many things that just makes a veteran so sad and so angry because I, I never would falter in loving my country. It's just the fact that Vietnam was a mistake and it's gone down in history that way. I'm sure some good has come from it but it's a case where I think there's more bad than good. But getting back to the demonstrations in this country, I got back just before that and before they were throwing medals at, at the airplane when you landed. I didn't, I didn't see any of that. And that's why I think, although most veterans would say it's a little bit too late, but when I took this hero flight, uh, I was blessed uh, to Washington a couple of years ago. That's when a lot of this came up from veterans that were in Vietnam later than I, and they experienced this. 
and were called baby killers. And here all they did was obey orders like we all do on the service. But that was kind of an unfortunate thing that happened, although I, I didn't experience that. But I mentioned earlier a little bit too late, at least the time I made that trip to the monuments in Washington. There was a lot of love expressed for the military. Thank you for your service. And even I think a lot of people would thank me for my service and they really, really wouldn't know what that was. And you as a, as a proud, uh, I guess, uh, I guess I could call you a veteran, couldn't I? Yes, as, 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 several as a, wars. <laughs> as, as, a, as a proud veteran, and I greatly admire you serving your country, but uh, I'm sure that at least I don't remember it from either of the Gulf Wars. I don't, I don't think Afghanistan either, but there was not that outcry with the public against the military service. I mean, the public questioned a lot of it vis-a-vis what were we in Afghanistan 20 years? Mm-hmm. What did we, you know, and, and you can get into so many things, but I'm sure you yourself, uh, now, when, when you uh, had your overseas duty, it was in Iraq? I did when Afghanistan. You, oh, you so you were in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you must know how that felt on your last days when you were getting ready to come home. Mm -hmm. It's a little different. We, 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 we're welcomed home, right? You know, like, you. so it's different. I mean, um, but, but but even yourself though, and I don't want to, I don't want to take your thunder as the interviewer and I'm the (laughs) interview. I don't want to try to flip that, but I mean, just like your last days, you must've had some, feelings, oh, I'm going to get to see my family. Mm-hmm. And you had a lot of, a lot of, I don't know, uh, I don't want to say anxious or chaotic moments, not to that extreme, but you had certain expectations and you probably viewed some of the change differently than it actually went down. Right. And, right. and, and that sort of happened to the Vietnam vets, although sadly, the last few years of the war, when it lost all support of the people, that's when the veterans got kind of ill-treated. Yeah. And the other thing I think they're very remiss on, and I'm very big on this, is is the mental part of it, the mental training. Because most people, A, don't want to admit when they've got mental troubles. Mm-hmm. And even today, as far as we've come, there's stigma attached to that. And you don't want to talk about it. And like I said, Vietnam was over, I think, in 72 or 73. It took the Army and, well, all the services and the VA till about 84 or 85 before they'd recognize it. It's kind of similar today to the Iraqi situation on the burn pits. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of controversy on that. And naturally, the VA and all don't want to recognize it because it's probably going to cost them. And that was the other thing about Vietnam. None of that cost, you know, or in, in Iraq or Afghanistan. Being in those countries, what that costs year to year to year uh, in, in dollars and cents. You, you wonder when you leave, <laughs> did the taxpayer get their money's worth? Mm-hmm. And you know, that's that's for the individual themselves to answer. But I just, you being the, uh, uh, also a veteran, just kind of your reactions when you came back. And again, none of those wars lost support. I think at the end they were tired of Afghanistan and they put pressure. But I don't recall that happening with Iraq. But I do remember on the first Iraq war, and I don't want to get into that. 
this is Vietnam, but it's kind of a parallel. But I remember on the first Iraq war, the senior President Bush, George Bush Jr.'s father, had always said, and he, the first, the first Iraq war proved his point, don't go over there and don't get involved. And that's what happened to us in Vietnam. And this, this isn't history number one, but Vietnam for huh, back in medieval times was, they were just a country kind of like the, the Middle East. There were always warring tribes and everything. And picking it up just pre-World War II, you know, the Japanese got in there and got in control and really, really ill-treated those people. So when the Japanese left, you know, when they lost the war, this is an interesting point in their history. Ho Chi Minh was the leader of the North. In the South, this was before the assassinated president, they had an emperor, although he had no power, but he was the emperor, Bao Dai. And when the French were defeated, because the French were there almost 100 years, that was a colony of France, the colonial part of it. Uh, they were defeated in 1954 at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. Well, okay, now here you've got it. You've got the, the bad middleman out of there. In this case, it was the French. Our case, it was us. But you got the middleman out. Well, there was still a civil war brewing between just the North and the South because naturally Ho Chi Minh wanted the majority of the power and he wanted the country. But just like Korea, they wound up dividing the country. So it was a case of the North Vietnamese against the South Vietnamese and us. Okay, and our allies that, that were with us. But it boiled down to being a case of that. And uh, uh, as a result, they had what they called an open season, isn't the right word, repatriation isn't, but it's a case where one time in their, in their lives, they could make a choice. They could join Ho Chi Minh in the North or stay in the South. So that's how Vietnam got divided. And post 1954, when the French left, we started by President Eisenhower way back then, sending early advisors. And we were supporting them on, on money and equipment. And then it just, it grew slowly, it grew, but exponentially from there. So that's kind of a thumbnail sketch of, of Vietnam, but but sadly, at, at the end, you know, the, the South, like I said, they were no match in, in fighting the, the, the North. They, and the North had the, you know, they were in the tunnels. And they didn't have it. They had it horrible. But yet, there was, there was just that, just that key difference, even when we were advising them. That, that cost them the war and cost them the country. Because that was a reason, one of the reasons we went is so they wouldn't go communist. Because in those years, that was the old falling down principle. Eisenhower and the political people believed that if you lost one country in Southeast Asia, the rest had fall in line as, as the governments all went communist. Well, that never did happen. But that's part of the reason we we supported Ho Chi Minh also, because that was a mistake. Because we supported him and then he turned against us. Well, when he actually wanted to liberate the whole country. Because we had we had actually supported him, believe it or not, the enemy. And I'm sure that's happened in, in our history as well, a number of times. But it's interesting to, to note. That's when the the major shift in government and leadership 
occurred over there. And, and uh, it, you know, today it's all written in history and, and we, we, you know, we can read about it. But back then, like anything that's kind of ongoing, you don't have that luxury. You don't know how things are going to turn out. And, and you know, you, you probably asked yourself, because you were in Afghanistan, well, really, what are we doing here? What are we accomplishing? Now, we got a written mission, yes, and, and everything is structured around that. But are we really doing that? Are we really doing for these people? And are they going to be with us in the future? So unlike Iraq and, and such, it's not all in vain, or you've accomplished nothing and spent a whole lot of resources. And the personal, the manpower resources, to me is the most tragic because the loss of life, what could be more key of key importance in that. But anyway, that's kind of, I didn't mean to digress so long, but that's kind of how Vietnam evolved over those mid fifties. And then of course, about 65, when we picked up the full war footing over there. So I hope your ears aren't getting tired. <laughs> I'm a talker, I love to talk. <laughs> and I would love to continue talking with you. Unfortunately, I do have to go. I um, apologize. Nope, I apologize if I don't if I feel sorry. Over. Nope, not at all. Do not be well, you're, sorry. You're a real nice person and I'm totally comfortable. And uh, I could I could talk to you all day. <laughs> but I appreciate I appreciate your letting me, you and my friend Rosa here. Can Rosa look at the screen and say hi? I'll be right here. <laughs> uh, Thank you. <laughs> Rosa Rosa's a dear, dear friend. And Thank she's you, Rosa, that, for setting this all up. And, you are very welcome. And she got me interested. I've been thrilled to do this. No, that's good. I never thought I'd be able to. I think it's great that you did. And I really loved your um your memoirs. Um and uh just for some clerical, I mean I don't know if Rosa has a, a cleaner copy of your memoirs um to send me. I the one I have is um is just if we can get a, a nicer um uh, scanned copy, if that's possible. Well, what I could do this this copy I have here, that was printed by a printer. Okay. So I could maybe get I asked them to scan that and get you another camera ready copy. Yeah. If I could do that. I but would love I, a better copy, yes. Okay, I'll try to see if we can get you that. Perfect. Be glad to do it. Thanks for reading that. Oh yes. And then boy, the other I'll, thing is if you have any pictures, I'm not sure you do. Uh, if you have any pictures from your time there, that would be really nice. Yeah. Unfortunately, I maintained a little history file with my notes and stuff mm -hmm. way back to 64. But that was the era we were all into 35 millimeter slides. And I have some slides, but they're more or less a time off type uh, things. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't think unless... I, I find a treasure trove somewhere. I don't think there it's possible to add the pictures. However, I did put at the end of the memoir, there's the uh, the one here. I think I think this commemorates the uh, women's part in Vietnam. Oh okay. uh, that statue, because we saw all the monuments. And then this was this is one of the major. Uh, mm -hmm. This is one of the major monuments on, on yeah. support, because you mentioned the traveling wall. Yeah, and uh, uh, I don't know if you want to give your your uh, comments about the Carney reunion, but to me the wall was one of the most awesome things, and you're allowed to trace names off of it. 
And uh, I can't even put into words what that meant or the changing. Have you seen any of the monuments? Um, so, I have been to, to, um, to, I, I, I lived in DC for a, uh, two years. So I have seen a lot, a lot of that stuff. Did you see changing of the guard? Uh, changing of the, the guard. At the un, tomb of the unknown soldier? No, I did not. I've not seen that. No. But that was one of my, I'll, I'll end with that, but that was one of my special places to see. Oh, that's it's beautiful cool. when they do that changing. Yeah. Of the precise way, because the Marine Guard is the one that does all of them. And the, the way they train for that. And, and, uh, they do that uh, twice every hour. They because yeah. different organizations want photographs with that reef. But yeah. it's uh, the, all that whole experience. If anybody that sees our interview has a chance to go on one of these Vietnam flights, and you're good at health enough to travel, because I had to travel with wheelchair, and right. they still got me around. Yeah, uh, by all means take the opportunity because it's a, it's a one in a lifetime thing unless yeah. you go on your own, but, right. but it's, <laughs> it's more fun to go for a group. Yeah. Well, ho I'm hoping that there's more of those for all of you. Because you say you lived in, in DC. Huh? I did. Yeah. I lived there for oh, two years. Must have been exciting. Mm -hmm. It was a good time. Probably harassing in some way. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't imagine I can't imagine the last time I was there before the monuments I took a cryptology course at NSA I remember we had to go around the beltway and it was bad then oh and that yeah. was that was in the mid 70s yeah it's pretty crazy and when I was, um, I gave birth to my daughter in DC and I was on the south side of Maryland like below DC. And then I had to travel all the way to the North side on the North mm -hmm. side of the beltway to go to when I, after, um, cause I couldn't have my baby yet, uh, the South side. So it was interesting. <laughs> what, uh, did you have any experience with the army security agency at all? Cause they were located in Arlington, Virginia, about, well, probably eight miles from the Pentagon. Off from no, Route 50. No. Yeah, I well, didn't, see, I didn't have any experience with them. Um, my I, my school was in in Virginia. I I was um, I went to the Foreign Service Institute for one of my languages, so I was there, um, in Alexandria. And then um, my other school was in oh, I can't remember, but it was a, and I mean it was I was learning a really interesting language in the middle of nowhere, so. Well, now, what language do you consider yourself the most fluent in? Or um, is there English. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, but, you blew my mind because when you said English, I thought, no, it can't be English. <laughs> English is kind of structured and, and all, but I guess for somebody that doesn't know it, it, it can be bad. Yeah, it's because I. It is. It's a hard language to learn, but um, I'm probably the most fluent in Serbian Croatian only because I studied that the longest. And then um, I'm my most recent language was Indonesian and I got to use it, you know, um, when I went to Indonesia. So that, I think that's one of my stronger languages as well. Um, well, but, my compliments, because I know from Vietnamese, and I lived in Thailand 18 months too. Mm -hmm. That intonation and the way they talk and so the speed crazy. that they talk it. I mean, I can I can learn the Hispanic language much easier. And again, I'm not saying I can I can learn it that fluently, but mm -hmm. the way it's structured and some of the things make sense to me. Mm -hmm. But you get into the Vietnam and you know, those intonations. Uh, that or in the Chinese language, is it the Mandarin that's the hardest? Yep. Mm -hmm. And you you took Mandarin, right? No, I did not learn Chinese. No. Oh, okay. Mm -mm. Well, my golly, you've got uh, how many languages have you got? Total? I learned four languages in the military. What? 
you you deserve a lot of a lot of uh, uh, I guess awe or respect because <laughs> to me languages are tough. They are and at tough. my age, and, and at my age now with my memory and stuff, that's not the point in life to learn language. <laughs> You've and learned like plenty. You, uh, could I ask, and I don't want to get too personal, but were you officer or enlisted? I was enlisted. You were? Yep, 24 years enlisted. You, I you retired in, as a senior master sergeant in E8 in the Air Force. You, you put in 24 years? Yes. Golly, you look like a baby. You look <laughs> like you could be in high school. And I don't say that facetiously. I mean it. No, nope, my daughters so and I, I, both of my children are in high school. <laughs> well, God bless you, my dear, because uh, I know from my years in the service, Air Force friends I have, and I know the promotions and all are not like they are in the Army. Nope. And I remember uh, when I was at Clark Air Force Base, mm -hmm. there was what the Army calls a sergeant major. Mm -hmm. which is the E9, mm -hmm. and yours would be called a senior technician? Chief Master Sergeant, I bet, you don't, I bet you don't see a lot of them running around. Mm, only 1% of the Air Force. <laughs> is that right? Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow, that that amazes me. Mm -hmm. But I know that the promotions and all, or at least back in my era, were, were a lot harder to come by. Yeah, they're I know that. Easy. I know the army, excuse me, the army officers would talk about it. <laughs> yeah. And and in fact, right now, as we speak, uh, one family from our church has a daughter that just started the Naval Academy in Annapolis. Oh, how great. So she's she's pretty thrilled, but she just started. So she'll she'll see some some big changes in her life, I'm sure. She will. But my compliments, I didn't know that you, you know, again, to me, you don't look like you have half the age to retire. <laughs> but that's wonderful. Thank that's you. wonderful that you you served like that. Thank that's you. why you, I think you had the ability to, it's good that you're doing these interviews because you, you, you have that service background. Yeah, I think it helps having a little bit of a background. Some of our other interviewers actually spent some time in, in Vietnam, um, but I think it's nice that some of us can a little bit relate. It, uh, I think in any life experience like this, whether it's Vietnam, Afghanistan or all, if you try to come home and explain it to a parent or a loved one or even somebody else, it's almost a case of the individual has to experience it for himself. Yes. And that's the way I look at it. Because there's just no way uh, you you can get a lot of things across. Mm -hmm. You want to and you try, but they just, if, unless they have that personal exposure, not all of them, but enough of them, they, they ain't got a clue. They don't. <laughs> and and you did, because I just, just did a, Oh, a burst of three and one three year enlist, uh, re up, I uh, re enlisted. So I only served six years active duty, whereas you served 24. <laughs> wow. That's uh, my compliments and thanks. <laughs> Thank and I got a Rosa, I'm sure, has I'll have to refresh my memory because my memory ain't what she used to be. <laughs> 